And there we should have it. It says we're live, but I never believe it. I think we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your, uh, in your top 10, I think, of favorite weekly series. <laughs> We've slid a little bit since we haven't actually <laughs> released anything in over a month, but we're back and we will have shows the next three Mondays. So um, we hope you can join us and we'll uh, enjoy hearing from some, some new faces and personalities. Um, this is Grace Under Pressure, if you haven't guessed already, where we feature consorts, royal consorts from around the known world. This week is Duchess Petronella of North Shield. Uh, and next week will be Viscountess Una of the West, which will be extra super special sister of my heart Una time and our first Viscountess. So um, that will be really uh, amusing, I'm sure, if we can. Um, she's, she's very naturally shy, so um, I'm not sure. Somebody will need to go over there and slip her some something. Maybe more happy. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure she feels comfortable. So, um, and this week I am joined by our wonderful stunt guest host, um, Shaxi. The beautiful, the wonderful Ashaxi. Um, I'm very sad to say that we can just barely see the werewolf head on the mannequin behind her. It's that's very disappointing. It just looks very menacing. However, it's a little um, Five Nights at Freddy's at, in Ashaxi's basement tonight, which is pretty amusing. Um, thank you, Ashaxi, for being here. Um, Ashaxi is a Laurel of Ontier, and she is inspired by her husband, Octomasades, and her beautiful children um, who are growing like weeds. And the next time I see them, I will not recognize them except for their red hair. So thank you, Ashaxi, for stepping in this week. Thanks for having me. And uh, welcome to our beautiful guest, Duchess Petronella from North Shield. She is a pelican and a laurel. And, uh, and just awesome. She was highly recommended to us by um, Duchess Eleanor de Bolton. Um, we really appreciate those recommendations because we might not have met Petronella without that recommendation. Um, and we are super thrilled to have you here today. Before we get started though, I would like to really quickly um, make a, a statement about um, those of us who are spending a lot of time online doing these interviews and doing shows and people doing virtual courts and virtual everything. Um, the um, ugly um, face of sexual harassment in these um, broadcasts has reared its head again. And it not directed at anyone here, but um, we are certainly not immune to it in the past. And I just want to remind people, though, of course, I'm probably not speaking to the right audience right now. Um, I want to remind people that um, when people put themselves online to provide SCA content, um, the type of behavior that that's demonstrated towards them should not be any different than what you would do in person. And if you are the type of person who would um, make sexual comments about somebody while they're doing, say, a collegium or an ithra or holding court or working in their capacity as an officer, then you don't belong in the SCA. So please um, show yourself the door if that's the kind of behavior that you think is appropriate. Um, we, the people who are doing this work are, it's unpaid labor, it's volunteers, it's predominantly women. And this has been a refrain in the SCA for decades that um, the type of behavior, you know, even if you think that it's welcome, even if you think that somebody has smiled and not said anything or laughed when you've made comments about their appearance or their bodies, um, it's not, it's threatening, it's menacing, it doesn't make us feel safe. And the very few people who do actively welcome it, it's probably based on a personal relationship that they have with you, in which case the context under which it's happening is really important. So it, it, it I, also brings up past trauma for people and right. you don't know what people's pasts are. So right, how right. dare you? How dare you? And, and it happens a lot. So it's not, it's no one incident. It happens more than, um, than any of us like to admit. And we've all made mistakes in the past. I am almost 50 years old. I'm sure I have said and done things that have made people feel unsafe in the past. And I try my best to be better than that every day. And that comes from first acknowledging that I have the capacity to do things that might harm other people. I certainly do. And then the next acknowledgement of, I need to be a better person going forward because when we know better, we do better. So if in the past you haven't known better, 
now you do. And if you are wondering if a behavior or an action that you have may, may be taken in a way that is threatening to somebody, if you don't have any women friends you can ask, that's a problem in and of itself. You need to have, you need to cultivate relationships with people that you trust where they can help calibrate what you do and when it's appropriate. And when you have misstepped and you didn't intend to harm somebody, what the next steps are to try and make sure that that harm doesn't continue and to maybe um, do some repair work if it's, if that's allowed, if it's possible. So you need to cultivate those relationships. And you can always talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you. That doesn't mean I'm going to like what you did, but you, you are always welcome to communicate with me directly. So also I got the permission of our guest before, well, permission. I told her I was going to say this so she could <laughs> let me know if she wasn't okay with it. <laughs> Actually, would you mind if I added a few words? Please do. Absolutely. So I was at a science fiction con with my lady in waiting who is, you know, very, very traditionally attractive. And we ran into someone she knew from college. And, you know, um, and he said, can I hug you? And she said, of course. And he says, I always go by the maxim that if you wonder if you're being creepy, you are. Yeah. So I always ask. So if there's ever a question, just don't. Consent is really, really important. Yeah. That's right. And also just look at the context, you know. Um, in the SCA, it, those lines can be blurry sometimes because, you know, our, in the past, maybe we were all operating under a different set of standards that some people were okay with, other people just put up with. Um, we don't know, but now we know. Now we know better. So be better than you were last week, last year, last decade. Um, and um, part of what we've tried to do in this series is to um, promote a set of values where we talk about how we use privilege and authority in ways that are positive and inclusive and draw people into the society and make, you know, help people feel safe in our, in our wonderful game. Um, and so, you know, that means that we, we have to speak up and not be bystanders. We have to say something when we see something. So this is part of that. It's, it's also though me saying to anyone who's watching who might wonder if they have the clout and authority to speak up, you do. And if you don't feel you do and you need an advocate, you need somebody to step up and say something on your behalf. I don't think we've interviewed a single person on this series who wouldn't do that, who wouldn't put that coronet on and march right over and do something or quietly, you know, if what you need is a, is a quiet um, advocate to go and, and do something on your behalf, I think they would do that too. So if you have any doubt, feel free to contact us. I know Ashaxi feels the same way I do. So, and not just in Ontario, every kingdom has folks like us who would be very happy to use their our pretend rank to help you with a real problem. Of course we would. So um, yeah, I just wanted to get that out there clearly. Thank you, Petronella, for letting us kind of derail the whole beginning of the conversation. It's important and I thank you for saying it. Okay, awesome. So on to you, because first of all, you look like a portrait. Thank you. <laughs> in front of your beautiful background and like, just everything. It's gorgeous. Not gonna lie, sewing rooms back there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, and in my case, I have my calendar still set to May. <laughs> so, yes. We all have our foibles, right? So yeah. um, uh, we, we'd love to just get to know you a little bit. Um, can you tell us about you, Petronella, who you are in the SCA, how you found the SCA, you know, um, just, just a little bit about your bio. Okay, um, I found the SCA in um, late November of 1999. Um, I'd been married for about a year and a half. My husband was a highway heavy construction worker who was laid off for the winter and used to working 18 to 20 hour days and um, had entirely too much energy <laughs> and we needed something to do. <laughs> And um, he's very sportsy. I'm not. Uh, so I had been, I was working at the University of Minnesota and I'd been a student there and they had at the time a student chapter, um, a college 
of Torrey, and I'd read about it in the newspaper, and I suggested it to him, and he's like, mm, you know, we were, we went to the Ren Fest and stuff like that, and then I mentioned Auburn Combat, and you know, the whole thing changed. So we looked up our local meeting, and it was like four blocks from our house. So we walked in on a Wednesday night, and um, I'm in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and um, it was the weekend before Boar's Head, which is our biggest winter event in North Shield, which is in Milwaukee, which is about a six hour drive. And we walked in and everybody said, are you going to North, are you gonna go to Boar's Head? Are you gonna go to Boar's Head and this and Boar's Head this and Boar's Head. And we walked out and I thought, these people are insane. They're driving six hours to go to Milwaukee for a day. In the next year, we made it to Milwaukee three times for a day. <laughs> But um, he found Armored Combat and he fell in love. Um, I've been sewing since I was seven. So I'm really here for the clothes. Okay. And everything else is, uh, you know, so um, we all, we each had um, an outfit that I'd made for Redfest. So we had some basic stuff to get us started. And um, in the SC, I don't actually have a persona. I have hey, a wardrobe. Really quickly though, the guys won't always admit it, but they're kind of here for the clothes too. Oh, my husband is so here for the clothes that it's not yeah. funny. The fighting's nice, but mm -hmm. when you get too old to fight or too broken, the clothes are still there and they are like, they love looking super spiff. So don't ever let anybody say otherwise. I don't believe it for a second. Oh, no, no. Well, at, at the time he was not there for the clothes. He is so totally here for the clothes. Now it is not funny. Awesome. <laughs> Um, we now have a um, 12 by 15 garb room oh. mm -hmm. that is separate from the sewing room that is very full so yeah we could um well we we have more garb than many shires <laughs> I have a pro I have a pro tip that if you don't have quite that much space to dedicate to garb but you want to maximize your 1970s split level not walk-in closets mm -hmm. we took the sliding doors off of every closet in our house as soon as we moved in we figured out that if you buy those rolling metal racks you know the mm -hmm. really really sturdy steel ones and you you put them in sideways so you can pull them out you can get three in a standard closet Ooh, nice. and take all the hardware out and that they're so much tougher than regular closet hardware and then you can just if you need stuff that you access all the time, you just hang them on the ends, but otherwise you can pull the whole rack out and like have your SCA wardrobes all organized um, because we we broke a lot of closet rods. It just kept happening and we're like, there's a structural issue here that I don't think we're gonna solve with um, getting stuff into the studs or whatever. I was like, we need engineering here. So my closet rods are freestanding made from one inch black galvanized pipe. Yes. That oh, it, you, and you wear later period stuff. I bet it weighs a ton. I, if anyone finds an indestructible hanger, I will love you forever because I go through hangers like I go through ridiculous I amounts bet. of hangers. I bet. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, you can see how a Shaxi stores her clothes. Yeah. She just has an ocean of creepy mannequins that stand behind her. I actually do have a rolling rack just off camera over here that Jesus is now leaning up again. Um, <laughs> uh, that I have my garb on, but I'm starting to outgrow it. So, mm -hmm. and I also have the um, hanger issue. And you wear tons of wool. So it's like heavy and, and heavy. Yeah, really heavy. My stuff's all lightweight, but I freeze my ass off also. Ontario is not a warm place. Uh, you can probably relate to that too, Petrana. Yes. So, so you've played your entire SCA career kind of in the Northern part of the country. Yep. We were, we were part of mid realm when I started. Okay. But um, we became um, a kingdom shortly thereafter. Yeah. So um, do you, so do you have a local group that you are also involved yep. with? Yep. Um, the Barony of Nordskogen is our local group. Say it again. The Barony of Nordskogen. Nordskogen. Yeah. Sound, sound, that sounds very Ontarian, I have yeah. to say. <laughs> Northwoods. Um, our um, heraldry is um, blue covered in snowflakes. Oh, very nice. Yes. So. Very, nice. very nice. I've always thought it's weird that in Ontario we don't have more salmon on arms. Like, Oh. You'd think there'd be fish on everything, but there's not, you know, maybe if we ever split off and do a new kingdom, we need to have like the salmon kingdom. I don't know. Are you pointing at fish? I am. That's a fish. 
Oh, there is a fish. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, um, so tell us, so, oh, I, when I interrupted you, cause I do that all the time, um, you were starting to talk about how you don't have a persona. I have a wardrobe. You have a wardrobe. I love that. Yeah, That's fantastic. So- and so everything I do, I try to do as authentic as I can from the skin out. These days okay. I do mostly late period, but I've done everything from ninth century through, you know, 16th century. And I also have gotten the Kingdoms Award for, North Shield has the Order of the Pixis, which is um, something from our principality days. It is for um, being as, peri- basically we refer to it as carrying the little bubble of your persona around with you. And... Okay. Um, I'm one of the few people who's gotten it who do, not, doesn't have a persona. Oh. But I also use that to encourage newcomers that you don't have to make a decision. You don't have to yeah. stick with some, you know, it's probably easier to do. Okay, it's definitely easier to do something really well if you focus, but you don't have to focus. Now, we have a particularly large, well developed, non neurotypical population in Ontario. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us tend to end up in things like, oh, the Laurels Council and as royalty and I don't know. I mean, we do have a lot of people with autism in the Pacific Northwest, including in my own family. So there is some data to support this, but I think it's also just that when you um, when you are that way, you attract other people towards you um, mm-hmm. to, you know, who wanna just do everything, you know? Yeah. So, so we're very accustomed to that. And also like, it might take longer to reach mastery of something, mm-hmm. but it's still, you know, that depth and breadth, you know, the, the breadth part is still really important, right? right. So we get too specialized sometimes. Uh, I know for myself, the joy kind of gets sucked out of things when I mm-hmm. feel stuck in one, like very ah. highly specialized mm-hmm. area. So. Yeah. And see, my husband is ADHD and he is laser focused on his persona. So he's gone the, the other right. half of me. Yes. That's funny, which is another part. I mean, ADHD right, exactly. manifestations, right? Yeah. Um, I know for myself, I get, I'll do something until I get frustrated with it and then I'll stop. And then it goes in the punishment pile, which Ashaxi and I are both very familiar with the punishment pile. And it stays there until I have the the vitality needed, you know, the, or the grip strength, which is often also what happens to go back and pick it up again. But I think there's a lot of us who do that in the SCA, especially if you, if you're a SCA long hauler, like I've been involved since 92. Mm-hmm. So over all that time, I've done a lot of things, you know, and I think, especially once you've reigned, you know, there can be for some people that we've talked to this desire to kind of let go and just be themselves and do what feels good because raining can be such a pressure cooker mm-hmm. and you know you, you're in the public fi- you know, face and you're you're kind of you get sort of trapped into whoever you were during that rain you know and it can feel really good to go and kind of be a dilettante for a while mm-hmm. yeah so when was your most recent rain petronella um two years ago okay so you're still kind of in the letting off the steam from the pressure cooker era, right? Yeah, well, and, you know, we went, you know, into, um, into COVID, but I'm still, you know, I'm still a kingdom officer. I'm still on the um, kingdom council. So I'm still doing plenty of SCA just because when people say events shut down, I like to say, you know, um, no, or the SCA shut down. No, the SCA didn't shut down. In person shut down. There's still a huge amount going on, you know. That's right. That's and right. if you had to take a break for your own sake, absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's right. Yeah. Or be I, productive I, in other areas. Go ahead, Don. Sorry. I keep Shaxi. reminding people that the officers are still handing in their reports. You know, mm-hmm. that, that everybody is still doing the work. Uh, they just aren't getting the joyous payoff of seeing everyone enjoy things in person so. yeah and every kingdom's handling it a little differently too we've realized you know mm-hmm. um and some of that is personality driven by whoever the royalty is and some of it is um the geographic realities of where people live and whether or not they've been able to open faster or not as fast or whatever so i don't know i think this has been a really good time for a lot of people to reset and think about what the sca really does for them 
Absolutely, because we're absolutely going to lose people for all sorts of reasons. But there's also people who have not allowed themselves to take a break for, you know, years, decades or more. And, you know, they got to do that. And I think that's a good thing, you know. That's right. And you're also a pelican. Right. So um, that assumes some visibility into the types of service that people can get really involved in right. with unrelentingly. Um, uh, and officers in particular, well, I had, a, I made a, a wee screed the other day on a post on another, um, the West Kingdom um, populist group um, talking about unpaid labor and women is especially doing a lot of unpaid labor mm -hmm. in the SCA and what that's like to carry the weight of that and what we can do better as a society to ensure that people, um, that we're not stingy with recognition. I think that's a big part of this is like, and I'm not talking necessarily about formal recognition, but recognition also comes in the form of giving people the grace to do things differently and recognizing their talent and recognizing their contributions such that you give them the space to also make mistakes and that it's okay and we shouldn't, we don't need to sit in judgment, harsh judgment of people all the time. Sometimes people don't do things perfectly and that's okay. You know, it's as long as we don't end up in court or mm -hmm. audited. And even then that sort of stuff happens in all organizations. Like people get audited all the time. So I just think, I just think about like, because we attach things like peerages and awards to some of this stuff, it sometimes creates sort of a false set of standards that mm -hmm. aren't realistic when we look at organizations in the real world. So. And, and it also sets up a, um, if someone isn't extended a peerage for the work that they do, it somehow invalidates that work. And um, I think that's a huge disservice. Yeah. Yeah. So, but as former royalty, you know, we were in the position of sitting in those councils of judgment, if you will, and hearing the criteria that people were being considered under. And, you know, I'm really curious how those conversations are going to change going forward, that if we put a different lens on it. Well, just before, not long before um, the shutdown, um, well, actually, um, actually, just at the beginning of the last train, a friend of mine was put on vigil um, for Laurel, and she is the master at, for, um, and her specialty is clothing, she is the master, master at thrift store and cheap but she's done the research so she knows what she's looking for and she can do these things really inexpensively and there was a lot of discussion in the laurel council about well what if we give her great materials but she has the skills she has the knowledge she's demonstrating them she shouldn't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars she's you know it's clearly all there right i that i love that because upcycling is one of my favorite things mm -hmm. and um a lot of my early garb was made out of um, repurposed or fabric that wasn't intended for that purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, the SCA was kind of founded on that premise also, by the way. Um, but uh, there's lots of period examples of things being upcycled. I mean, look at all a lot of ecclesiastic stuff. The vestments mm -hmm. were frequently things that had been cut up and reused. You know, if you see the back of them, they were just like hobbled together out of other um, pieces and people reused trim and you know there's whole cultures like in India you know there are garments where when their life is over they burn them and take the gold out that had been woven into the cloth you know you think about all of the different ways of these um, these different cultures you know making recycling the materials that they had at hand, right? Mm -hmm. Or how many things like, it's like, oh, all the pearls are gone off of this. They went somewhere else. Like <laughs> they weren't just, they didn't just fall off. So I love the idea of that. Um, one of my favorite geeky things is, um, one of my lady in waiting is, um, because when, when I took her as a dependent, I was a countess. I did not have a um, bestowed peerage and she was 19 and she needed to belong to someone. So the solution was to, you know, attach her to the county. Um, in North Shield, um, royal peerages do not come with patents of arms, and neither does the rose. So, 
just as enough. So, you know, technically you're not peers, but you are peers. <laughs> but um, so one of our first projects together is she, we took my first garb, took it apart, made her a new bodice, took a doublet of my husband's, cut it down. So one of her outfits is cut down from our stuff. Love it. That's perfect. And super period. So I know. we're so geeky. <laughs> so I love it. I love it. There, I, you know, I'd love to see any, if your, um, your former or your friend, I don't mm -hmm. remember what the relationship was, has done research on period upcycling. I'd love to see that documentation. I'd love to see the, the, re the body of research around that. I just know of things anecdotally from like going to a museum and seeing, right you know, or seeing something, you know, we see that also in when there's um, fibers that are really different in extant mm -hmm. pieces where it's clear that they put together two things that hadn't originally belonged together. But um, I love, I love seeing how that was done and how frequently it was really done, you know. And, and we um, have a, a several laurels who do the same thing, who um, are really talented thrift shoppers and um, find things to to make into clothing from from their stuff and and uh accoutrement for the camp and and you know things to cook with and all of those things um we have a really wonderful tradition uh in the summits and on tier of um dressing up the hotels that we have events in and um there are these beautiful hand-painted wall hangings they're all thrift store thrift shop bed sheets mm -hmm. um, but you don't know that looking at them you know they just look like incredible wall hangings so i think thrift store shopping is a really or cool my gift. favorite is ikea as is to get um real linen fabric i have a whole bunch of like real linen curtains and real linen panels table runners because they often have things made out of linen there and it's so much cheaper. Like the, the cost of that linen is like nothing. And I got, I have boxes of linen table runners that I got for a dollar each. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, earlier this year they were clearancing sheets. And I know one of our local members went to Ikea and just took and filled the cart. Love it. She just bought them all and then threw it on the list on the, you yeah. know, I will be able to get rid of these. I love it. Yeah, I love it. So, um, we, we got a little off track here, but I, I think that um, this, is, this is just evidence that you probably should live in on tier and you may not have heard of it, um, though we did talk about it, I think in Eleanor de Bolton's um, interview, which I think you watched, that um, we um, eventually, when we meet people that we think should live here, we start sending you materials for retiring here. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, buying property, um, just the best places to live, what's most walkable for, as we are decrepit SCA people. Well, so. my sister lived in uh, Mount Vernon and then Squim for years. Okay. So I've okay. actually been out there quite a bit. As evidenced by you pronouncing it Squim. That's very right. impressive. <laughs> yes. I, I might have spent the uh, morning with a uh, Duke and Duchess from Not Our Kingdom. Uh, showing them around and talking about yeah. neighborhoods so we just assume all the best ones will get here eventually and we'll you know our our kingdom will be dotted with people burned out sca people mostly but still you know the retirement homes will be very colorful there will be big recycled sheet cotton recycled <laughs> sheet wall hangings and <laughs> oh we're so off track yeah no, that's right <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. It's all good. Hey, um, as we continue, why don't I throw some slides up and okay. um, we can continue talking from that perspective. I always, let's see, I have to remember how to do this all over again, you guys. When you um, started in the SCA, did you uh, have an idea that you wanted to be a Laurel or that you wanted to be a Pelican? Did you have an idea that those were your people? Um. I wanted to be a Laurel. I kind of figured I'd be a Pelican. Just, you know, I'm organized. I'm, I am a policy wonk. I'm the one who read all the rules before they went to the first event. I read Corpora for my, before my first event, you know, so. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I just realized that I didn't, there we go. All right. So um, on the far, um, 
well, above the um, lady in um, Rust, that is probably the first SCA picture of me. That was a mid-realm coronation and um, of Bardolph and Bree. And um, the um, lady in Rust there is um, um, by Countess Layla, who's a very good friend of mine. And that was her laureling. And I'm in, um, in red wearing the veil and wimple. So this was very early Petronella. So you can see the, but, but this was, this is my first time out of North Shield. This was right as we were going kingdom. And um, this was in um, April of 2001. And this was really the first big thing in the SCA I was part of. The, um, Ken and Layla, the prince and princess were from our local practice. You know, they took us in, we became friends and then they won Cornet and suddenly, you know, we were on the ride with them, you know going places, doing things, carrying stuff. So did, um, did, did, it you was a weird being, did you start out being Petronella? Was that the first name that you that you chose? It, it, yes, it is. Took me about six months to a year to choose a name. Uh, that's the trick of Shaxi. Yeah. If you pick your name too fast. <laughs> a number of us have changed our names. Yeah. Well, the and screen. it was getting to the point where people were threatening to give me a name if I didn't pick one. Yes. And that's, so I had a retinue member that I named mm -hmm. because I needed to give them an award. And I was like, you don't have a name. You don't have a name, which is how they ended up with the last name Spoonbender. <laughs> that was their, anyway, they may have had a spoon bent on their head once, but um, that's probably a story for another time. How about, oh, there we go. Okay. This is really cute. Yeah. This is actually one of my first, um, my favorite SCA pictures. This is um, the morning of the first crown we, we actually won. At the time, we were um, very proudly North Shield's biggest losers. This was our 15th crown. We'd fought in 14 of the 15, and no one had lost more North Shield crowns than my husband and I. <laughs> but on the other hand, we'd spent, you know, all these years talking about it and making plans. Because I am firmly in the camp of, if you're going to do the thing, plan for it. Mm-hmm don't you know i i don't subscribe subscribe to the well i can't plan because that would be presumptuous right and the other thing and the advice i give people all the time is if you're going to start fighting in crowns for every crown make a nice outfit for at least one of you because then when you do win if you do eventually win you have a good base and if you don't, the worst thing that happens is you have a fabulous wardrobe. That's good advice. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, if you don't have a great wardrobe and you win, suddenly having to, that's a lot of um, resources to produce one. Yep. yep. Um, is your crown uh, invitational only or how do, you, how do you run that? It is not invitation only, it is open, but socially we have a very, it's very much you shouldn't fight in crown unless you're prepared to win crown, which I don't entirely agree with because it makes for very small crowns. And I also think there's something magical about being in crown, both as a combatant or a consort. It's an experience you can't get elsewhere. And I also don't believe, you know, um, I, you know, because people say, well, you could win if you fight. If I authorize tomorrow, I will never win a crown. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Same. Not everyone is going to be in the, you know, wood and crown. You know, if you're a member of the chivalry or a top end fighter, you need to think about it. But I do think everyone should fight. Everyone who wants to should fight in crown because it is a unique SCA experience. It really is. It really is. Yeah. We have open lists in Ontario, like mm -hmm. very open. Yeah, it sort yeah. of requires proving ground mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. And here that is frowned upon. Mm. And I, that's a thing I would like to see shifted because I do want people to be serious about it, but you know, I also want people to have the experience. I think there's a balance there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's so happening in the picture? So, yeah, I have a new slide up. Yep. Yep. So this is, um, this is our first reign at Gulf Wars. Um, my husband has, um, his persona is a Polish Hussar. Those are the wings he wears on his armor. <laughs> uh, clearly a Shaxi recognizes this. 
<laughs> but um, he made them for the first crown and they traveled with us and it was just kind of an iconic thing. And we wanted to do something cool. You know, as royalty, you want to make magic, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, so we thought, well, maybe we can hand, cut the feathers off the wings and hand them out. Maybe people will think it's cool, but you never know. It could also come off as really cheesy. So at Gulf Wars, we li lined everybody up, you know, invited everybody to the um, field for court and, you know, we're under a, um, a shade fly and our Chamberlain had, you know, the wings set there and prepped and we had the dog's toenail clippers because how else do you cut with? <laughs> and gave a big speech and Vlad reached over and cut the first um, feather and this clipping sound and the front row of people kneeling surged forward and tried to tackle. <laughs> and there was this, no. And the prince said, his majesty has spoken. And it was possibly my most moving experience in the SCA because people lined up, you know, you've both hand, you've handed out favors. It's usually kind of chaotic. People are talking, but people lined up he would clip one, hand it to me, and I was going to walk down and hand it. And someone said, don't make her come to you. So people lined up, they'd come, they'd kneel, they'd take the feather. Everybody was crying. The field around us got quiet. People were watching and crying. Um, and for a very small minute there, we were actually king and queen of something. Oh. We made magic for our kingdom and for the SCA. That's very cool. Wonderful. It's such a personal um, token to give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. So it would have been great if you had all been wearing all the feathers from his wings. Like, yes. <laughs> well, this is just after we stepped down um, and we hadn't actually, the wings didn't have feathers again yet. <laughs> so uh, this was at an ANS event, just my friends and I, um, you know, local ANS event. And um, they had a Laurel meeting that day. And at the end of the day, um, two hours later, at the end of court, I was a Laurel. They just Aww. decided and did it. So of course, everyone else in this picture, well, the, the king and queen had told, you know, a couple people they were probably going to do it, but not sure. So plan, but don't tell too many people. So everyone else in this picture knows what's going on. I do not know what's going on here. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. So this is a story of unintended consequences. So um, my husband plays World of Tanks obsessively. He talks about tanks. He's known for liking tanks. We were at a feast and um, Master Eldred presented him with a model of a da Vinci tank. And he says, oh, this is lovely. Call my laurels together. And then ask where the real one was. <laughs> so they went home <laughs> and started planning. And Eldred contacted our Chamberlain and she said, okay, we can do this. And then he contacted the Gulf War staff and this is a legal siege weapon. It's People beautiful. can shoot out of it. And it, it's a flat pack tank, model of a Da Vinci tank. So we were at an event in South Dakota and um, this little event, and we were um, brought over to our thrones and told to sit there and just wait. So we were being compliant because something was going up and they rolled up the door and this came in and um, there were no words. <laughs> So, it's beautiful. Uh, I thought it was a yurt with a uh -huh. very weirdly placed stovepipe. Yeah. You know, those I'm like, the, that's um, not what the smoke holes for guys. Like, <laughs> no, no, it, um, those come out and you can fire combat archery through it. Nice. So this has been on the field at Gulf Wars. I, and I love that there are actually uh, tank tabards in play here as well. Yes. Are, the, are those the, the, the crew that mans the tank? Or, yeah, well, they're the crew that built the tank and sponsored the tank because um, the gentleman in front, where, um, in red, wearing the black hood, he actually did it as an engineering project. He got college credit for it. 
nice. He, yeah, he, you know, um, did a model and, you know, a budget and hours and everything else. So he actually, he won um, engineering awards for doing it. I'm just wondering what's the vulnerability of a, of a Da Vinci tank siege weapon? Um, they had specific rules that if it got hit by a spear like twice or three times that um, it was dead. Or, but people would also um, spear when the, the gun turrets come out. So people would send spears in through it. At one point at Gulf Wars, people are spirited through it. And there's like five or six people in there. And um, the tank commander said, we're all dead. And somebody's like, no, no, we're not. <laughs> it's it's like, beautiful. No, no, because <laughs> suddenly there are spears coming in from every direction, but nobody could see what they were shooting at. It's beautiful. And and also, if it was a yurt, this could be a photograph of people from on tier. Like, yes. I just love that about the SCA that, mm -hmm. you know, all SCA pictures from all places, you're like, yeah, that, that looks like that could be on tier. Yeah. <laughs> Easily. I love it. So one of the things I had the privilege of doing is um, I was on both committees to um, explore and create what ended up creating the Masters of Defense. So um, I was the Rose representative on the first one. And um, they the way they structured the first one was um, representatives from each peerage and then some at large representatives. And I'm really torn because I absolutely think that rapier deserves peerage level recognition. I think it was a mistake at the time that we were not allowed to discuss a peerage for more than just rapier and omnibus peerage. I absolutely understand why, because in a perfect, I know one of the questions you usually ask is if you could create any award, what would it be mm -hmm. with no political? If I could do that, I would have opened the chivalry to all martial activities. I absolutely understand why that wouldn't have worked in many kingdoms, mm -hmm. but I think it was a disservice to only have rapier. And now we still have, th we have archers, we have equestrians, we have these other groups that do not have that same path to having their excellence recognized. And I also, I think there's a lot of fighter or martial art privilege in the SCA and the fact that, you know, um, I can do eight arts and I'm just a Laurel, but my husband does four martial arts and he's a quadruple, you know, he can get potentially someday get four peerages, just reinforces that. And it reinforces, you know, and like for service. And because martial arts have a serious gender divide, it also reinforces that, you know, misogyny, misogyny that women's work is less important. That are well, service. And that we've held people in the martial peerage to such a low bar yes. of other kinds of service that um, anything that even resembles like really meaningful service outside of their primary role as a knight starts, you know, immediately to talk, we talk about Pelican mm -hmm. level contributions and um, which is great. I'm glad that we have people who are both Pelicans and Knights, but the bar for them, you know, Typically, if we're looking at someone who's a Laurel Pelican, it's a pretty high bar to do both. And, um, but we, you know, it's, it's sort of like, well, knights don't, a lot of knights don't do any service at all, mm -hmm. let alone take on offices related to their, to their particular sport mm -hmm. or do the sorts of things like um, Rithkin does, who is one of the sisters interview network interviewers, you know, where she was organizing these massive, you know, fighting practice type events and really, you know, and was the secretary of the order and like a level of service that's, that really is Pelican level. Mm -hmm. um, yet, you know, we don't have that minimum expectation that every night teaches or every night um, organizes events or every night marshals or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably also been a mistake or a failing um, of the SCA in general, that we didn't hold every night to that bar. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I'm I full on board. I wish that we had done that as well. I wish that, that they, it was all under our martial peerage. And, uh, you know, you don't hear people say, well, the service she does is laurel service. 
you don't hear you hear that said in 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 uh, relation to uh, laurels uh, being considered, but you never hear that uh, said in in relation to a marshal. Right, like that's just the service that's expected of a knight. It's like, well, really, that would be great if that was true, <laughs> but you See, don't. That isn't the conversation. Enough, we do hear that in North Shield. Great. That service to martial activities, but I do think there is a different bar. I absolutely agree with that. We we do we have very few knight um, laurels. I mean, light pelicans. We have quite a few knight pelican or uh, laurels, but fewer, many fewer knight um, pelicans. But there is this weird thing in North Shield that somehow service to martial activities doesn't count. Mm. But on the other hand, you know, the people running the lists are not usually the people who do the martial arts. You know, mm. and the people water bearing are not doing. You know. Um, Martial arts take a lot of resources outside from outside the community. One of the things I um, I was asked to donate a tourney prize, and I'm kind of anti tourney prize in general because we don't do a lot. You know, re renown is good enough for every. We don't you know do all these prizes for arts or for service. Right. But I said um, I made a deal that I would donate if I kept track of the hours if they would find people who were primarily fighters to do that many hours of volunteering at our Kingdom A&S event. They decided they didn't need me to donate, which was okay, but. <laughs> That's a lost opportunity. Right. But, you know, many people who aren't fighters spend a lot of time making fighting happen, but I don't necessarily see the reverse. One nice thing about our big kingdom ANS is that they almost always have a big fighter practice at the event, mm -hmm. which is cool because it, it means that we pull a broader range of people who, you know, it may be that they have partners or household members who mm -hmm. have other reasons to be at the event, but it does provide this very nice big fight practice that people can do. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just sort of a larger ambient presence of um, of fighters at those events, provided mm -hmm. they're in locations that allow for that. Um, similarly, our Twelfth Night event has traditionally also been the um, the Rapier Champion Tournament um, at the same site. Um, so, uh, so some of that I think matters. You know how we layer these things together mm -hmm. and don't segment them off away from each other. But I agree. And, you know, prize tourneys, I, I think, you know, if you're someone like my husband, who's been playing in the SCA since the 70s, mm -hmm. and he has a lot of prize tourneys that really tell a story about kind of the history of our kingdom, you right. know, there's different prizes from different places. And a lot of times, you know, it was a championship and you got a prize for being the champion or whatever. And those were really meaningful to him. And he keeps those. Mm -hmm. And I get that. But you know, when you just are giving a prize and it doesn't have any particular connection to the actual event and they're given a chest of stuff and it's basically largesse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can, I can really see what you're talking about. Um, you know, people, fighters enter tournaments because of the renown. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, so I was on the first committee and then the second committee um, each kingdom chose a representative and I got chosen again and we validated the first one and then we won crown and so we were on the throne when the BOD announced that they were you know they had the meeting and they said they were not creating the rapier peerage and I have to say I was very impressed with the ship of North Shield because within 15 minutes of that discussion announcement um, um, our peerage lists actually discuss candidates and stuff I know not all kingdoms do we do electronic discussions as well as in person. People and one of the board members had suggested that maybe they should go on the chivalry. Within 15 minutes, we had the chivalry having a discussion of, okay, if we're going to add people to the shiv, who are we going to add? So wow. I think it would have worked here. I absolutely know there are kingdoms it wouldn't have worked in. You know, the fact that there are kingdoms who are very proud they've never created a master of arms because they don't believe in it. When the master at arms really um, predates all the kingdoms. So I can see why it wasn't done because in many places there still wouldn't be rapier peers. But the fact that the shiv were allowed to do that, so there's a level of privilege there. Yeah. 
So what are we looking at in this photo then? Is this that committee? Well, no, what happened was, so this happened and then they reversed it a week later. And of course it was happening May 1, which was two weeks after we stepped out. So, you know, we're there in the, um, in the center and um, wearing with the red hood and the um, lady neck, those were our prince and princess. And they made it clear that because we were, I had been so involved, the six, we sat down and picked our first mods together and they let us announce it and put them on vigil. You know, they could have definitely kept this for themselves and this honor, but it was very much a joint decision. So we told um, the kingdom when we were going to do it. And this was all of our white scarves. And then in the center front, the um, three are the ones we had chosen for our first three mods. That's awesome. And then we had the decision, how do you create a carriage order? Because, you know, there hadn't been a new one in our lifetime. How do you make these decisions? You know, who begs the boons? Who did? So what we did is um, the um, um, standing um, next to Vlad, who's wearing the black in the center, black and the turquoise in the center, is um, Duke Siegfried and Duchess Ber- or Countess Berdai. They were our first king and queen. So we had, so at this point, it was the only four of us who knew were um, Duke Tom and Duchess Siegfried and um, Vlad and I. And we gave them the two and we asked them to beg the boon. Because who better to start peerage order than our first round? Mm -hmm. And the other thing we did to try to ensure it, it, you know, was accepted is in North Shield, when you beg a boon, they call the members of the order forward and ask if they believe this person should be a peer. So there are no members of the order. So we called every peer at the event forward together. Wow. To nice. attest that these people were their were their peers, so so you know, but it was a it was a really great thing to be part of. It was also a very difficult thing to be part of because how do you make these decisions? Mm-hmm. You know, so as part of that, you know, of course, we talked to the rapier community a lot. We decided, um, and uh, based on their recommendation that we should close our order of the white scarf because it was a terminal order and it was more than a grant level order. And they felt that to, you know, the standards would be different and to keep it special, we should close it. So the scarf I'm wearing that um, is being taken out, again, that's Countess Burdai. This is at the Gulf Wars um, Rapier Rose Tournament, the Ounce Dior and Rose Tournament, which I believe is the biggest rapier tournament in the known world. And so um, we named our last white scarf. And then the scarf I'm wearing was a gift from the queen of Anstiora at our first coronation. So that was the queen's white scarf. So um, I had Verdai take it off me and then standing next to me is the queen of Anstiora. So we returned it to um, her homeland. Wow. That sounds like a really emotional moment. It really was. Leo. <laughs> Sorry, I have a dog. <laughs> we, between all of us, have many dogs. So, <laughs> and cats. <laughs> mm. This is also a golf horse just because I needed one picture on horseback with the wings and the like, capes and stuff. Because you said the guys like the clothing. Oh, yeah. My husband is such a peacock. He was called that for years. <laughs> And so we just leaned into it and actually made ourselves peacock cloaks. I love it. And it was actually a really cool thing because people wanted to be, it gave them something they could be part of. You know, they could decorate royalty rooms. They had a theme. So that's it on that one. This is just, it's one of my favorite SCA photographs. Um, Ajax was one of our champions. He was our general at Gulf Wars. Um, he is former military um, and he used those skills as a leader and really was a great motivator and did a fabulous job. And this is just a picture his wife took because one of the things in all of my pictures is I don't think any two of them were taken by the same um, photographer because there are so many amazing photographers in the SCA with so many different styles. 
that I wanted to highlight various ones of those. And is this a court barony? Yes. Okay. Yes, because um, it, um, it's hard to tell, but they are um, oak leaves on there because he is a Roman persona. He was wearing late period because he was our champion for the reign. And um, they have, um, most people are familiar with the wreath of laurels. That was the symbol in Rome. But there was also the wreath of oak leaves, which was a symbol of um, high military honor. So we did his coronet. We made it ourselves and put the oak, the oak leaves on it as a um, to um, signify that. Very cool. And there's another wreath, the myrtle wreath, yes. is another really um, significant. And I know that because I'm working on a painting right now of someone with myrtle. Although myrtle is hard to tell from laurel in a lot of mediums. It's true. The, the leaves are sort of longer and skinnier. And right. there's, but yeah, it, it's very similar such that I think a lot of people just think, assume that they're the same thing, but they're very yeah. different. So yeah. This is adorable. It, it's just another picture. Um, It was like 90 degrees. We were hot, we were sweaty, but a new person wanted to take our picture and wanted a picture taken of us. And it's just one that I love. We were on our way to court at Dub Dub, which is our big summer event. We're wearing velvet because, you know, um, it's kind of um, our household motto, motto is it's better to be beautiful than comfortable. <laughs> Tell me about the reliquary uh, box that he has. Um, it's actually an ammo box. Oh. It's really his man purse, but but yeah, it's um based on a Polish um ammo box. Interesting. This is cool. And this is at Gulf Wars again. Because I um we don't we both do equestrian, but we don't have a lot of chances to do it here in North Shield. You know, I really, you know, one of the things that would definitely lure me to Ontier is your robust equestrian program. Yeah, I mean it's a lot easier to get um horses to use umbrellas than ice skates. Yes. Well that's what fact, I always say. Well, in fact, one of our um um Two of our reigns at golf course we got to meet count edward from oh, yes who also does polish that's right does the hussar so um he, but he lives in my barony which is why i recognize the, the... <laughs> yep <laughs> so you may not realize this but this is like the international symbol for wings <laughs> because people who have seen him before especially like at golf course they'll be like oh you i recognize you you with the and the <laughs> Awesome. But, and wow. then, so we wanted to do something, you know, we knew we've ran three times. We are not really, we're highly unlikely to do it again. You know, they were all lovely. They were all fun, but it's a lot of work. And there's also so much room for so many other people to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And one of the beauties of the SCA is there's room for, different kinds of reigns and people to do different things. So um, we are not a kingdom that has a lot of strong traditions. So each reign has a chance to do a lot of things very differently. But that means people have a chance to do very, very, you know, have royalty that really speaks to them. And I think that's a great thing. So one of the things we wanted to do was really make, um, we've joked that Gulf Wars has a war point for the processional. And I really think the, the Gulf Wars processional was, is one of the coolest things in the SCA with the horses and everyone and you know all the royalty and people get to walk with their kingdoms and show their kingdom pride and really belong to something. So we decided on the way home from the crown we won that we were going to do Gulf Wars Fabulous. You can um, sort of tell in the front, there are nine suits of Hussar armor. Wow. So my husband, his squire and one of his, um, uh, um, one of our shared dependents built them um, between, um, in the time we were on the throne. Well, my husband had one set, he built a new kit and they built all these the whole time. Meanwhile, and we had a hashtag that we used Gulf Wars Fabulous. 
and we invited uh, members of North Shield to wear Polish to either make it or wear it. So I brought every scrap of Polish garb Vlad has, which is something like 25 outfits, um, but, and lent them out to people. And then I helped people pattern their own and held sewing days and did this. And the outpouring we got from people was really amazing. You know, uh, we had people who was the very first event who we lent clothes who were um, a little bit nervous to the, you're just gonna let me wear this silk thing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really a great thing to let people be part of something because I really think yeah. um, as royalty you have so much privilege you know you get you get gifts you have a travel fund people help you do things and you have two choices you can either feel like it's something you deserve or you can use that to do other things and I really really struggled with letting people do things for me it is hard, but it's also important because it allows them to be part of something. And this was our chance to let people, you know, to help people be part of something and do that because um, the first, our first event after um, we won our first, our first event after we stepped up the first time was a newcomers event in the Barony of Windhaven which is um, Northern Wisconsin. And the Baron at the time brought all, like they had nine newcomers or something at their very first event. Wow. And after court, he brought them up to the thrones and he, he said, these are your thrones. This is your presence. And he walked them through taking it down. He grabbed the um, keys from me. He walked them through taking it down, putting them away packing them in the truck and they all helped and they all carried a thing and everything was gone within you know five minutes and all taken care of and then brought them back and we gave them tokens but at that moment he gave them ownership in the SCA you know this was their game the royalty weren't somebody out there that they couldn't touch they couldn't talk to they could be part of something and that was a really big lesson for me yeah. in letting people help you that's one of the pieces of, of advice I give to um, my friends that I have not reigned myself, but I have served a lot of reigns. And mm -hmm. one of the, the most important pieces of advice I give to my friends who do have a hard time letting people do things for them is don't deprive these people of, mm -hmm. of doing this service because it's a gift to be able to serve like that. That's right. Don't deprive people of the privilege of giving Dagmar coffee in the morning yeah. it's really selfish to not have me caffeinated properly <laughs> well, and, but the flip side to it is you know because I absolutely agree with that but um don't think that you're actually king and queen of something oh, yeah, absolutely. that you deserve it you know because there's entirely too much of that sometimes too yeah, the people I give that advice to are not in danger of that. Yes. They're having a hard time feeling they're worthy of, of being queen. Uh, so, yeah. well, and, you know, and it's hard, you know, because we're not raised on the class system. And, and there's also, um, I have control issues. Having people pack my stuff and pack my car is, you know, it's a, it's a learning curve. <laughs> you know? There's a really big difference, though, between having issues where you want to control other people and having right. issues where you want to be able to control what happens to you. Because right. when you get home and you're unpacking that car, that's your car and it's your stuff. And you're the one who's going to cry when your favorite mug has broken because yeah. it was not packed well or whatever. Um, so that's not, to me, that's not control as much as it's, you know, you have to let go of right. the consequences of things. Yes. Those things happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, all right, well, that was the last picture. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. But, um, you know, one of the privilege things is one of the things um, the king and queen allowed us to do our second reign while we're prince and princess is um, I, along with um, a member of our, um, a friend of mine who's a member of our shield, um, Noble Ulf, went through and removed all gender from um, North Shield laws. And um, it's interesting because I didn't realize um, Ulf is um, 
uses they them pronouns and I didn't you know it wasn't something that you know I'm like you approaching 50 this is new you know <laughs> and I wasn't aware you know until they you know changed to using those pronouns how pervasive it was but it's interesting because in SCA governing documents we don't use king and queen it says sovereign and consort right you know the SCA documents use it it's not so went through and removed king and queen and prince and princess um right. and you know changed everything to not only gender neutral but to non-binary and actually it ended up working well because not long after that um um Roder and Yehuda um won crown and became the same same sex um right. rulers in the SCA so all the law changes were taken care of because when summits had their first same gender um couple Eleanor had contacted me and said, how'd you do this? And I actually worked, I talked to the people from Ontier about, you know, what we did and how, how we did it and why, because um, at the time, North Shield was the first kingdom to do that. And most of it was seamless, but there was some interesting things like, for some reason, um, we had a law that said, Baron refers to the male gender and Baroness refers to the female gender. We didn't have that for any other title at any level, it's like, why do, you know, so we went through and removed some laws and made some changes and just did things like that because I think especially marginalized people are going to make a softer approach. They're going to read your documents. They're going to check things out. They're going to see, and, you know, and they notice this. So if you can do things like that to, you know, it didn't change anything substantive whatsoever, right? But it makes it a better place for everybody in the SCA. When we um, championed in Ontario, a number of different royal couples championed inspirational equality, which was kind of the precursor to this, and get it, making sure that our kingdom language didn't include anything that specified what um, gender um, people had to be in order to be considered appropriate consorts to a fighter. And um, removing that language su such that when Kapora was finally changed, we could just default to our our language. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, it was I, we had visited Penzik that year that this was all being hotly debated, and there were people that were not in favor who were reigning in other kingdoms, which was really eye opening because in Ontario we had so many people who, at worst, didn't care. Mm -hmm. Like, we're like, whatever, that's fine. You know, we had a lot of people here who just were like, that's fine, you know, whatever. Oh, they're saying that we can't do it, then we want to do it. Mm -hmm. Like we want that, then we want this to be open to everybody because we don't let people tell us what to do when it comes to our lists. Mm -hmm. Like, you might see that, but most people were just like, okay, you know, okay. that sounds like the right thing to do. And um, so it, it really, it was nice from that perspective regard that, um, you know, the few people that did dissent, I mean, honestly, hopefully I've, they're gone. I don't, I don't hear from them, you know, and we do have people that have been subject to homophobic language and slurs. And of course, that's always going to continue mm -hmm. to some degree because those people are always going to be around. Um, but we can make it so that it's intolerable for them to open their mouths if they're going to feel that way. Um, and I think that's the thing now that we are talking about gender identities and, you know, that was actually a big part of inspirational equality too, actually was like, well, who's going to be the gender police mm -hmm. and go, you know, and check somebody's, are, you, are we checking modern ID? Are we checking, are we doing genital checks? Like what's the standard under which we're holding people to ensure that they are, have the right plumbing to mm -hmm. reign together if we're keeping these laws the way they are? So it was, I got, I got into some real weird conversations with people where I'm like, who is, who's, who's checking down people's pants? Is that a thing that you want to start doing? Yeah. You know, because that's pretty messed up. Like you're going to be on the wrong side of history, both metaphorically and literally, if you do, if you, you know, propose that. So, um, and I think, you know, it speaks also to the idea that, you know, people want to keep modern politics out of the SCA and you hear that. And to me, that is a total dog whistle for 
we want to keep doing things in the same shitty way that we always have. And we don't want modern um, awareness about the way we harm people to become part of the SCA. We want to continue to harm people in the way we always have. It, well, it, it, tell, it tells me they just don't want to do any work at all to change yeah. better. I'm sorry. And some people's identities are just political. You know, if you're trans, that's modern politi politics. How do right. you keep that out of the SCA? I, I realize the answer is they keep those people out of the SCA, but you know, that's right. not an SCA I want to be part of. I'd rather have the trans people in the SCA. Thank you. Yes. They're, they're, I would much rather, I mean, obviously I love my trans friends anyway, but if I have to choose between the bigot and the trans person, that's not even a decision. I'm no. like, anti-trans people can just go away. No contact. You're not going to be missed. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know. They're not in our retirement invitations no. to on tier, to retire in on tier, by the way. This is a trans friendly kingdom. You, so those people don't get to retire here. And if they're already here, we'll have to deal with them. So, yeah. She says in a not very threatening way at all. <laughs> well, and I like to think we are, but of course it, it follows modern political lines. You know, here in the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. we're a large metropolitan area. We're, you know, pretty liberal. Minnesota is, you know, pretty liberal. And then we also have the, you know, North and South Dakota, who are very politically different, you know, so I can't say as a kingdom we are, I know there are places that are better than others, but there's also room to be, do work for all the marginalized people, not just trans people, for people of color, for, you know, right. well, and um, one of my things of being personal is, of course, women's issues, you know. Yeah because you know we've talked about you know hidden working with women and honestly you see that as royals because north shield is a great kingdom to be queen of we have very strong queens we accept very strong queens um i think most of the time if you removed a member of the couple most people would remove um the male member of the couple and i'm i'm using the gender binary because that's the most common one and but, she does um, not mean member in yeah. that way you're thinking it <laughs> we are not <laughs> suggesting violence against men that is no. not being proposed here no but i don't know why you would even say that petronella gosh <laughs> bad peer <laughs> but <laughs> but it also means as consort your world changes a lot more when you win yeah because the sovereign they're still fighting they're leading the army you know in north shield one of the things is almost the vast majority of our chivalry are authorized rape here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're doing that too, which I think is part of why the mod thing happened because they're on the same field. There's not a thus and them. Interesting. Um, a significant portion of our consorts have authorized rape, you know, and do other martial activities too. So there's, a, but the sovereign's doing martial activities and the consorts doing well, everything else. You know, you show up for the NS, you read to the kids, you do the tea, you teach the class, you do this. And, and um, like I said, I'm a policy wonk. I've read all the royalty handbooks in the known world. And the Mid-Realm one said at one point, I don't know if it still does, that the queen is expected to be graceful and kind and well-spoken and soft-spoken and the king's kind of expected to be a jerk because he's an alpha male and that's just what they do and it was not in a that's okay but it was a he will be allowed to get by with behavior that would be absolutely never accepted yeah i i want to give a shout out to my husband duke <laughs> thorin who is not any of what we're describing oh, yes. he and I, I do feel fortunate and I, I really do, but he is someone who's always been a very hands-on king. Mm -hmm. um, he, he reigns directly, he gets involved. When we did awards, he was always super involved. You know, when we transitioned from paper awards to online and mm -hmm. like getting things done electronically, you know, he, it, all of that, he was right there making decisions and it, and it's really his happy place is helping to run an event. Yes. I took charge of the clothing side of it, but mm -hmm. come on, like, that's my, that's my thing. But 
but honestly, it was really very much shared and he shares parenting with me and everything. It's very egalitarian in that way. And I think the good thing is I, in our generation, I think I know a lot of men like that who, mm -hmm. you know, I think about Akhtamis and um, Ashaxi, <laughs> yeah. Um, that even when there is a division along those lines, there's a recognition that the contributions uh, are, are that need to be balanced, mm -hmm. you know, that a is going to need a really big fat break if she's been with the kids all day, you know, or whatever the dynamic was. Um, so but, I think- But it took a lot of work to get there. Yeah. That was not uh, the natural state of being. <laughs> no, I agree. But it, you know, I think it's starting to- move and we see a lot more couples where both people fight mm -hmm. yes yeah. so i think that's also kind of cool where it's like well who's gonna not fight today you know <laughs> yeah because entirely too often well it's interesting that in most kingdoms the ceremony for chivalry you know when you're made a member of the chivalry involves the significant other being part of getting the belt and uh, many mod ceremonies uh, but the laurel and the pelican don't necessarily involve the significant other in the formal ceremonies. And it says a lot about our culture that, you know, well, and we had somebody um, apply to one of our crowns who listed her at, um, SC, her primary activity as um, supporting a fighter on his way to, on his journey to the chivalry, which is great, but what do you get to do for you? Yeah. You know, what's your, because you don't hear about supporting, you know, a woman on her way to the Laurel or to the Pelican often, but you do hear about fighter support very frequently. Yeah. And often it is, you know, in parenting, you know, if one's a fighter and what's not, well, of course you're, and I understand because, you know, I, I do most of my SCA at home. My, you know, my, I can do so much of my service at home. I can do so much of my sewing, you know, my ANS at home. Fighting, you need other people to do. Yeah. But at some point you need to balance too, or the person, you know, if you're just going to an event to do childcare, you know. Yeah. I mean, I know women who would go to our 12th night event and not leave the hotel room the entire yeah. weekend because they're with kids, you know, and we do a pretty crap job of supporting people like that, you know, in meaningful ways, which means not just going and saying, hey, can I relieve you of your children but can I provide an environment for you where your children are included too awesome. is yeah. tough you know and being tolerant um, and accepting of the presence of children at mm -hmm. events is also something like no, don't treat them as a nuisance one of my things I'd really like to see us do in the future at indoor events is provide um, a crying room if you will a room where kids can be with a parent and the and court is broadcast into the room and have that just be something we do from now on where they're it's mic'd in and they can watch it on a monitor and they can watch court from another room if their kids are of an age or they themselves are of an age where sitting in court is just not possible you know but that there's proximity or even broadcasting it to the hotel rooms through the closed circuit system so that people still can be included in ways that are meaningful to them um, I don't see any reason we couldn't start doing this. We have e easily have the technology to do it. Everybody has it on their phones right now. So it's things like that where, you know, we need to think outside of what our preferred personal experience of BSCA is, right? That's what inclusivity is. Yeah, for sure. Well, and see, I don't have children, so I haven't had to deal with that, but I could definitely see, you know, um, there was a big difference in how we divided stuff between the first reign and our last reign, you know, because like you said, it takes time, it takes practice, yeah. you figure this out. And the other thing was, um, because of the nature of our jobs, I was at work, um, I work at a desk with a computer, I can answer emails, I can handle things the day. Um, my husband is a bridge inspector. He's hanging under a bridge, you know, he is unavailable for this stuff, you know, so please tell him thank him thank him for his work <laughs> in in Ontier in the areas of Ontier that Don or Shaxi and I both live in we are so bridge dependent if any part of our bridge infrastructure goes down it completely immobilizes our entire region 
So we we love our bridge inspectors. Thank you. <laughs> our 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 local bridge is uh, over a hundred years old and crumbling. Yeah. So good times. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway, not that all work isn't important, but bridge inspectors really are very important to us too. <laughs> well, I, I'm um, I'm a bridge designer, so I'm oh. I'm building. He's I'm building the new one. Oh, oh my gosh, we have a power couple here. You totally should move to on here. <laughs> Please come to Vancouver, Washington, and fix us. <laughs> yeah. Portland, Seattle, bridge bridges everywhere. Bridges. In fact, we have a bridge shut down. The West Seattle Bridge is shut down in, in Seattle now for the foreseeable future. And it really has dramatically changed the um, quality of life for people who live in that part of Seattle. And it, it makes a really, really big difference here. So it's like infrastructure matters. <laughs> it <Shocking>. is. <laughs> It is, and you know, we are, it's 6.20 uh, local time. So we are running towards the end of our interview time. And the really cool thing is because you've seen these interviews before, you hit on nearly every one of our questions that we normally ask, but you just did it very naturally as part of the conversation. So um, that's very cool. Thank you for that. Um, I did though need to pull us back to asking you some very important questions. Okay because normally we would have a virtual gift basket that we would present you with because it's part of the great tradition of the SCA is that you have a bunch of royalty and they all give each other all the largesse that um, their populace has been making or special gifts from their kingdom or whatever. And since this is a virtual gift basket, we can put anything you can imagine in the gift basket. So um, this is when we try and figure out like what your preferences are. So. So first of all, my people would have asked your people if you're more of a dark or milk chocolate person. Dark. Dark chocolate, popular answer. Red or white wine? Not a wine person. How about a cider person? Cider. Cider, okay, we can do cider. And puppies or kittens? Puppies. Okay, puppies, this, this is all very doable. So of course, we're giving you a wonderful gift basket that as you know, if from listening to past interviews will not have handles on it because I think baskets with handles are the devil and should not ever be given as a gift to somebody without their direct consent because they are impossible to do anything with once you get them home or in your car. So this does not have handles. And in fact, if it's an part of the Ontario tradition, it's probably a beautifully embroidered bag, which is so much more useful anyway. Um, Shaxi, what's a dark chocolate from your area that you're in love with right now? Oh, I am completely blanking on the name. <laughs> we have a lot of really great chocolate here. Let, let's just, you know, we'll go with just the top quality. Let's go with some Franz. It, it much loved by the Obamas for a very good reason. So we're oh, good. Are you an ice cream person? I could be an ice cream person, yes. I, I would put in some Ruby Jewel ice cream. Uh, okay. That is some really good stuff that we have here in Portland. And since this is a magic gift basket, it has a compartment to keep it like churned and cold and like ready for consumption. <laughs> so that's really great. Um, so uh, we have a lot of cider in Ontario because this is apple country. Um, so in fact, um, read up on the story of Johnny Appleseed and his connections to this area. It's he is cool. actually, I'm a direct descendant of Johnny Appleseed. You have to move here. Oh my God. <laughs> Super important. Um, so, so uh, you know, there's a lot of great ciders here. There's um, Seattle Cider Company makes some wonderful ones. There's also a Schilling Cider House here where you can get flights of all these different ciders. So I think what I would do is give you a big fat gift certificate if I could, if I could afford it with grad school money um, to go and do tastings and that would get you to Seattle so that you could be like yeah I think maybe I do want to live here um, and we don't <laughs> give away puppies but we do offer the opportunity to crawl around with some because that's the best thing in the world but then you don't have to keep them or potty train them and I think in your case let's go with like some some good old-fashioned golden retriever puppies because they're so friendly and sweet um, but you don't have to put up with the hair afterwards you just get to like cuddle them and sniff their puppy bellies um which is like the best thing ever so the other thing i think i would give you is like 
maybe like a, a train ticket where you could take a tour of major cities and go to their thrift stores <laughs> and like and look for wonderful fabulous you know Elizabethan Tudor fabrics and stuff and maybe take your friend with you um who was elevated for that and you could do like YouTube videos in these different thrift stores and give people some visibility into all these fabulous locations how does that sound a shaxi I think that that's a really good idea for a YouTube yeah. show and if you do it on a train you could decorate the train car and like <laughs> I don't know they probably wouldn't let you do that but it's kind of a cool idea right so that, that is our virtual gift basket for you. We show, so appreciate your time. And um, thank you to Eleanor, Duchess Eleanor, for giving us the recommendation to talk with you today. This has been a real pleasure for us. Um, I feel like we learned a lot about the origins of the mod as well, um, and some, some insight into that, which is fantastic. Um, and um, I, the inner kingdom anthropology is always super fascinating for us. Any parting thoughts, ladies? Nope, oh, you're good. <laughs> We're good. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you to the Sisters Interview Network for hosting us today. And join us next time for our interview with Viscountess Una of the West um, and watch the Sisters Interview Network for the event. Thank you, Grace. It was wonderful to meet you. Thank you. Good night.